continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind, and my guest is once again Nobel Laureate in Medicine Harold Varmus, whose new W. W. Norton memoir, The Art and Politics of Science, is a wonderful introduction not only to his own training and achievements as a pure scientist, but to his years as director of the prestigious National Institutes of Health during most of the Clinton administration. For nearly a decade now, Dr. Varmus has been president of the world-renowned Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center here in New York, and has just been appointed to co-chair President Barack Obama's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. So let's pick up now where we were last time. And Dr. Varmus, we were talking about the new administration, its attitude towards mm -hmm. science, not so much to condemn the old administration, right. but to look into the future. What do you see when you look into the future? Well, I see a president who has inherited a lot of very deep problems um, in foreign relations, the economy, uh, immigration policy, energy uh, needs, uh, uh, environmental degradation, and uh, concerns about climate change. Um, and the thing that I find inspiring about uh, uh, Mr. Obama, one of the reasons why I'm very happy to have an advisory role in his administration is that uh, he perceives the role that science can play in virtually all of these arenas. Uh, America has been successful to a very substantial extent because we have encouraged our best minds, attracted talent from abroad, uh, made discoveries, applied those discoveries to our commercial enterprises, uh, and uh, our leadership in the world owes a great deal, often an unappreciated great deal, to how we've succeeded in science and technology. Now, we've had failures in this, in this realm as well, and I think the president appreciates that. We don't have what is conventionally called a, called a scientifically literate uh, public because uh, our educational system has been geared, uh, if we use a metaphor, to mining its diamonds as opposed to encouraging development of the pipeline. And, uh, it is important, as the president has uh, acknowledged, to ensure that all Americans who go through our high schools learn the precepts of modern science, learn enough about uh, math to uh, understand risk and to be able to evaluate uh, uh, increasingly common public arguments about things that range from uh, disease incidents to stem cells to uh, uh, the effects of uh, of global warming on uh, our many activities, the contribution that carbon emissions make to uh, to our environment, and you know, to appreciate those things, one has to have some grind, some grounding in science. And all too often, uh, those who don't show the potential for stardom in the K through 12 educational system get ignored. We need to change that. How do you change it in the educational system? What do you want? The fundamental the thing is, of course, to do? of course, uh, our, our public education system is grounded in the states, and the federal role at this point is, is to a very extent, a large extent, advisory and based on advocacy. But the, the 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 first step in my mind is always better salaries for teachers. If we don't increase the prestige of teachers and pay them more, uh, we're going to be stuck with an inferior system. The way things stand now. Um, Fewer than a third of science teachers in high schools actually have a degree in science. 
And uh, if we don't have science teachers who understand how science works, they're going to do what uh, you know is uh, obviously excusable under the circumstances. They're going to depend on textbooks and on the, the dreary uh, recitation of, of scientific facts as opposed to teaching the scientific process that has uh, turned so many people uh, away from science over the years and make them feel that, making them feel that science is neither approachable nor enjoyable. Um, and uh, you know, we need to change that. We'll only change it by attracting college graduates in, sci in, 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 in science curricula. Uh, to uh, to um, an experience as teachers of high school science. If someone were to turn to you, given your years now, uh, not just at the national institutes, uh, but at Sloan Kettering, and to say, well, let's take this one great area mm -hmm. that's related to science, mm -hmm. cancer, where are we in terms, I'm not going to ask the question that so many people ask you, do you have a cure yet for cancer? <laughs> if I had it, I would tell you, believe me. <laughs> I, I'm sure you would. Yeah. Your answer is so frequently, there are so many cancers. Yes, well, and that is, uh, and if I do say so myself, the correct answer. One has to appreciate that we're not talking about one disease. We're talking about lots of different diseases. How many, we're not even sure yet. But and where are we? Well, um, with the many. Yeah, with the many, we understand basic principles of how cancers arise, regardless of what they, what spe specific types of cancer they are. Um, in some cases, we've made tremendous progress and can control cancers so that they no longer are killers. Um, but unfortunately, for the vast majority of um, patients who have the common forms of adult cancer, of the colon, of the lung, the breast, and others, uh, you know, we still uh, have a long way to go to reduce mortality to an acceptable level, which in my mind is basically zero. I think we should be able to control all cancers. We're not going to eliminate uh, the, the occurrence of cancer. We can reduce it in some cases, for example, in lung cancer by uh, finding ways to control tobacco habits. But, but the cancer is a part of the human condition. It comes about as a result of mutational processes that are essential to life and to diversification of forms of life. Uh, and we're not going to eliminate cancer entirely, but we can detect it earlier, we can treat it better, uh, we can control its manifestations when cancers have, uh, have appeared. Uh, we can show we do that with some selected cancers now, but we, are, we aren't uniformly successful. Does that frank, honest approach diminish the interest in people in supporting Basic science I don't think so. Needs. I think uh, what, it, what it tells people is that when we have basic knowledge about cancer, we can devise new ways to detect it and treat it and even prevent it. And uh, we have made progress, dramatic progress, on some cancers. Uh, and that includes some of the common cancers I mentioned where death rates are still uh, unacceptable. But, uh, but you know, there's no doubt that uh, we've made tremendous progress in both preventing and treating breast cancer, even though, as I say, death rates are still significant and it's a common disease and we need to make a lot more progress. But, but the fact is progress has been made and our understanding of the disease is dramatically greater than it was. And then not to be um, forgotten, the experience of being a cancer patient is dramatically changed by, by many of the things that we've learned how to do to control pain and nausea and bone marrow suppression and many of the complications of treatment. Uh, and uh, for that reason, you know, we don't say the C word anymore. We, we, talk, about, we talk about cancer as another chronic disease. Um, and many of our patients, uh, even though they, they have a disease that may ultimately be mortal, uh, nevertheless, uh, these are diseases that people can live with and work with for many, many years because of our enhanced ability to control the disease for long periods of time. It's fascinating, the C word. Uh, it wasn't so many years ago that I learned that I had cancer, and uh, I'm terribly much aware of the unease that people had in talking about it, feeling that I would shy away from it. That's changed. And Dramatically, and it's changed and in part because years. we, you know, we recognize that this is, you know, cancer is still a terrible disease for many people. I'm not trying to minimize that, but, but the approach is a much more open one uh, for many reasons. I think in general our society deals with 
problems like cancer or uh, sexual orientation or race in a, in a somewhat more open way than we used to. Uh, but um, part of the explanation for our changed um, approach to cancer is that, uh, that we do have better ways to control it. We do have people who have built advocacy groups and, and uh, patient survivorship and support groups that are immensely helpful in, in allowing people to confront this disease. It's a disease like others. Uh, heart disease and diabetes and stroke are, and many neurological diseases are also um, uh, devastating diseases. Uh, just as much or more so than, than cancer. Um, and uh, we don't shy away from talking about those. So uh, I think it's a very healthy thing that society has come to accept cancer as, an, as a, another form of understandable illness. I think uh, one of the things that made cancer difficult to, to grapple with initially is it was so mysterious. And now we actually can say in pretty concrete terms what goes wrong with the cell to make it a cancer cell. I think that helps in beginning to understand why your own cells turn on you. That's an interesting phrase, your own cells turn on you. Well, you know, it's, this is not an infection. I mean, infection contributes to, to the development of some cancers. But the, the, the striking thing for those of us who have been studying it is that uh, a normal cell undergoes mutational changes, and, and as a result, it acquires new properties, excessive growth, a failure to die on schedule, and that means too many cells and you have an accumulation of your own cells that, uh, that um, presages your mortality, and that's a difficult thing to accept. You know, that, that brings me back to something I meant to ask you about in our, our first program, talking about your new memoir, The Art and Politics of Science. Um, somewhere in here, and I have to thumb through my notes to find the page, you talk about the um, about Lysenko. You talk, talk about the Soviet mm -hmm. Union and mm -hmm. the limits on right. the ability of scientists. The inheritance of acquired characteristics, and mm -hmm. uh, perhaps I should wait till we're off the air and ask you this. <laughs> but I remember when I was at Columbia College studying with Theodosius Dobzhansky, the great geneticist, and he said, "Someday we'll learn to have a little more respect." for Lysenko and the notion of the inheritance of acquired characteristics. Have we come to that uh, point yet? Uh, not exactly. I mean, we do understand that, uh, that um, there is an environmental component to disease that's very important, um, but that's not the same thing as genetic change. Genetic change, some of it, the only, the only part that's inherited are, are, are aspects that involve uh, chemical modification of DNA, and uh, uh, that is, there is a, a parental imprinting of our, our genomes that uh, is not encoded in the simple sequence of our bases. Um, but the, the significant principles of Mendelian rules are still in place, and uh, they've become more complicated because we know that genes can undergo changes that Mendel would not have predicted. But um, Nevertheless, uh, the you don't I, think the, they're going to come the, from the soma. The, the, the notion of, uh, of acquired characters. Well, you know, it's it's more than than just uh, uh, saying that, that that the soma can contribute to the germline, which is a very problematic idea. It probably hasn't doesn't have any uh, bearing on the situation. But this notion that uh, an, an environmental experience or ex, uh, something that occurs during your lifetime that's not a, a change in your and your uh, genome can be transmitted, um, it, it doesn't have any uh, deep validity at this point. All right, I'll wait for another 50 years and ask. Well, we can ask again. Yes, a good idea. Uh, scientist. No. Going back to uh, the Science Council, I remember when Bill Golden was here, mm -hmm. first so excited about the notion of needing to have a scientific advisor to the president. What will be the relationship of uh, this council uh, to the advisor? To the president. Sure. So Bill Golden, who died recently, was a great uh, patriarch of science um, and uh, uh, was uh, the, the, the man who got the, the uh, science advisor position established in the White House uh, almost 60 years ago, um, uh, was very instrumental in, in developing the notion that, that the president should be getting advice from the scientific community. 
uh, and that notion was expanded in 1957, just after Sputnik, when uh, Eisenhower uh, asked for the creation of a council of advisors. Uh, had a slightly different name than it does now, but basically it's a bunch of outsiders who come to Washington on a regular basis, work with the science advisor, and meet with the president and give him advice on a variety of topics. When that group, which we'll now call PCAST for simplicity, uh, was first uh, convened, it was, an, it was a group of about uh, 20 elderly white male physicists. And uh, that was, in a sense, a manifestation of the Cold War, of anxiety about nuclear threats uh, uh, in response to uh, the, the, the achievement that the Soviets made of putting a, uh, a small uh, vessel into orbit, uh, Sputnik, um, and uh, perhaps appropriate and characteristic of its time, but no longer appropriate for what we intend to do in, the, in this era. So what will happen in, in, in this administration is that uh, we'll have a, a council yet to be um, fully announced uh, that uh, will have uh, representatives of many different scientific disciplines, not just physics, but uh, other, many other scientific uh, areas uh, ranging from biology to chemistry to in, in, information science and, uh, and uh, economics and other aspects of, uh, of uh, social science, sciences um, with a great geographical and ethnic diversity. Um, to um, provide advice across a very wide spectrum of, uh, of activities and interests that the president ought to have uh, that can be informed by what we know about science and technology. The, the relationship you ask about is simple. The, the president's science advisor, John Holdren, who's uh, trained as a nuclear physicist, who's um, uh, very knowledgeable about uh, everything from arms to energy to environmental sciences, uh, is working full-time in Washington, running the Office of Science and Technology Policy, as well as advising the president. He is one of three co-chairs of our council. Uh, the third is Eric Lander, who is a distinguished mathematician and genomics researcher uh, at the Broad Institute in Boston. Um, and the three of us will provide oversight to a group of probably roughly 20 people or so who uh, will um, meet uh, on some as yet undetermined regular basis uh, to uh, decide what should be studied in greater depth and what kind of advice to give the president. I gather the most important thing is that whatever the advice is, it will fall upon an open mind. Uh, indeed. Uh, that perhaps might be an invitation to, to bring the open mind on, on your show. <laughs> but but uh, yes, we like to think it's an open mind. We know uh, from our own personal experience with uh, President Obama that uh, he indeed is a man of uh, tremendous curiosity and rare intelligence and uh, scholarly attitude. You know, we've been talking about science, and I've been thinking about the word reason, and it seems to me that what we have in the White House now is a man who respects reason above all else. Reason, and not, not just reason, but reason that uh, is looking for evidence and wants to draw conclusions from facts. Um, so that's, that's what science is all about. I mean, it's not as though science is some laboratory exercise. Science is knowledge, and uh, knowledge is acquired by asking questions and looking for information that tells you what the answer might be. And You've been quoted as saying that you think that um, um, the area of foreign policy mm -hmm. is subject to... Uh, um, help openness, a scientific approach, aid on our part to health and other science adventures abroad. Indeed. I, I think um, science and health are two areas uh, that have been um, moderately neglected in the history of the U.S. As a, as a vehicle for improving relations between countries. It doesn't imply any endorsement of uh, uh, another government's policies for us to have relations with uh, that, that involve American scientists working with scientists in another country, even a country that uh, has uh, um, partially hostile relations. We're not going to go in some country with which we're at war, but but there are countries with which we have profound differences over commerce or 
uh, military activities or other things that, where we can build bridges that are a effective in establishing rapport between our countries, uh, uh, useful in developing new knowledge, um, uh, and uh, serve as a vehicle for improving our reputation um, in the area and in the in the country that with which we may have disagreements. Now, is this Harold Vormis scientist or Harold Vormis political scientist? Who's well, talking uh, this it's, way? It's, it's both in a sense. It's not the administration speaking. Of, um, obviously, these are views that uh, I will. Uh, have expressed in the past and will continue to express and in, in whatever role I have and 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 as an advisor but but uh, and these do not imply any commitment by the u s government to anything but but uh, I think we have learned some lessons over the last twenty or thirty years about the utility of science and health as uh, as means for for promoting cooperative action between countries um, i 've uh, been hearing from Many countries in which uh, we have made um, approaches uh, about the the benefits of, uh, of helping to build science in those countries. Just give me one example. About uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, two major government agencies, part of NIH and USAID, built a malaria training and uh, and research center in Bamako, Mali. Uh, Mali is a country with which we have quite good relations, but uh, it's an extremely poor country, and it's one that uh, in which science did not thrive. Uh, but as a result of the center which we built, uh, there is a um, a tremendous interest in science in the, in the Malian government. They pay great attention to the center. The center is a great vehicle for training scientists uh, throughout Africa in malaria research. Uh, it's resulted in the training of many young Malian scientists who come to the U.S. and then go back. Uh, and it's a, it's a very constant and a productive bridge between our two countries. What about the movement the other way? We've, I've heard a great deal about the fact that in recent years, mm -hmm. scientists who would come here from other countries to be trained, perhaps to stay, perhaps not, but to increase the scope of our knowledge of the world. Well, they I haven't been coming. Will they now? Do you think the no, movement no, will? No, scientists open up? have been coming from other countries to the U.S. Um, there have been some some difficulties with immigration policy that, okay. that have created some some minor problems, and, uh, and I shouldn't call them minor. They 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 have not resulted in dramatic and dramatic uh, declines in uh, the the number of people who come here for training. Um, but uh, and those are policies that need to be worked on. But uh, I thought where you were going with this was to uh, point out that that uh, there there is a uh, potential problem uh, bringing scientists of talent to the U.S. and then not having them go back to their home countries where they can play a very important role in the development of those countries. I mean the brain drain. Yeah, question. the brain drain. And uh, you know I think the brain drain is a is a two-edged sword. On the one hand, uh, the U.S. has a vested interest in trying to bring great minds from anywhere to settle in, in this country. This is a country built on immigrant uh, and immigration, and uh, I think it remains uh, a very potent, very potent part of our uh, effort at, uh, at um, progressing in a, in a way that's uh, advantageous to the nation. Uh, only 12 percent of our country uh, are immigrants, but 25 uh, percent of our scientists, 25 percent of the members of the National Academy of Science, 25 percent of our Nobel Prize winners uh, the last 15 years have come from, uh, from other parts of the world. That's uh, an interesting set of statistics. Uh, on the other hand, I think it's also important for us to recognize that we bring to this country for training a great many more scientists than we can possibly employ, and we ought to be helping to make the the home country, the country of origin, a place to which scientists we train can return. Uh, and certainly that's true in the example I gave you of the center in Mali. People who come here from Mali to be trained in malaria research can go back there and work very productively, and many have. Dr. Varmans, we have two or three minutes remaining. Uh, a uh, question you may think passing strange. Uh, what are you going to do when you grow up? <laughs> What's the future? Well, look, I have a very good job that I'm enjoying doing right now, running the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center at a time of, uh, of economic difficulty, and we're, 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 we're surviving quite nicely, thank you, but, uh, but it does create problems. We want to uh, 
do the best we can to exploit the opportunities that uh, have resulted from changes in our understanding of cancer as a disease. Uh, we want to play a role in um, adapting to whatever changes occur in healthcare in the Obama administration. So there are many exciting things for us to work on at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, I yeah, have but a lot I was of, talking about its president, well, you. Sure, but, uh, but uh, as president, I'm taking a very active role in what we do at the center. Um, I also, as you know, have uh, some outside interests of significance uh, in trying to revolutionize the way we publish scientific literature uh, through uh, open access business methods and by creating uh, a digital public library, which exists now at NIH in, in England. Um, so I will continue to work there. I'm doing a lot of things abroad. Uh, I look forward to uh, my activities on the President's uh, uh, Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. Um, I'm continuing to finish up some work for the Institute of Medicine on global health. I um, hope to play an active role in that, in that area. And maybe I'll write another book sometime. I certainly hope so, particularly given the excellence of this one. Brief question. Uh, the lot of uh, open science, the lot of what you were campaigning and crusading mm -hmm. for, satisfied with what's happened? Well, we've made a lot of progress because virtually every major funding agency in Europe and the U.S. has endorsed the policy that, that work supported by those agencies needs to be in the public domain within six months to a year, and varying by agency. Uh, we've also made a lot of progress through open access publishing. Um, some colleagues and I founded the Public Library of Science, PLOS, PLOS.org, uh, where all the journals we publish um, make their content immediately available to anyone in the world. Uh, we pay our publication costs by asking uh, the, the, the authors to use part of their grant money to pay publication costs, which averages about 1% of the cost of doing the research. This is working as a business model. It's becoming increasingly popular among scientists. Uh, and uh, that, too, has been, I, in my view, a, a, a partial victory. We're not, we're not there yet. My goal is to see the scientific literature completely transformed, uh, and uh, hopefully that will come to pass. Good. Positive note to end on. Thank you again for joining me today, my Dr. My pleasure. Bronx. Thank you. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. For transcripts of today's program, please send $4 in check or money order to The Open Mind, P.O. Box 7977, FDR Station, New York, New York, 10150. Meanwhile, as an old friend used to say, good night and good luck. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.